Hey everyone, it's Chow here, and today we are going to talk a little bit about the endosymbiotic theory, so let's get started. Now this particular video is going to be relatively short, I only have one slide on it. But what exactly is the endosymbiotic theory, or the endosymbiotic hypothesis, and why is it important? So, if you think about it on the general basis of things, there are certain organelles within the cell, for instance, mitochondria, as well as chloroplasts, that have their own DNA. So it's very interesting because chloroplasts have their own sequence of DNA that's separate from the DNA found in our nucleus. And then similarly with mitochondria, they also have DNA that's also different than the DNA within uh, our nucleus. And what's really fascinating, for example, with mitochondria is in order to make some of the proteins found in the mitochondrial membranes, you actually need the sequences of DNA both in the nucleus as well as the sequences of DNA within the mitochondria in order for the cell to produce the necessary proteins for the mitochondrial membrane and potentially even beyond. So what's really fascinating is that there was an individual who proposed this concept of the endosymbiotic hypothesis, which basically means that in the past, these organelles, like for instance, mitochondria and chloroplasts, are actually their own separate organisms. They're actually kind of like bacteria that are floating around in the surroundings, and then some other cell perhaps engulfed them, but instead of digesting them, Ultimately, over time, evolution caused this event that allowed for that particular uh, original bacteria to become part of this new cell. So basically, the endosymbiotic hypothesis or the endosymbiotic theory is just a theory of the evolution of some of the organelles found within the cells. And the idea is that some organelles were once independent prokaryotes like bacteria. And we can see this is the case because there's evidence for it. If you take the DNA from, for instance, mitochondrial, uh, for, you take the DNA from mitochondria, and then you run that mitochondrial DNA through some kind of a sequencing device, and you look at the individual base pairs, you can see that after building a phylogenetic tree, it's quite similar to that of the typhus bacterium DNA, which suggests that there's some kind of a common relation. Similarly, if you sequence cyanobacteria DNA and you look at the chloroplast DNA, they are actually quite similar, which makes actually a lot of sense in this case because cyanobacteria are photosynthesis, uh, they can photos they're photosynthetic. They can, they can go do photosynthesis to make their own sugars. And similarly, chloroplasts for plants can do the same thing. So what's really fascinating about the endosymbiotic hypothesis or the endosymbiotic theory is that it states in the past some of our organelles are actually their own living organisms and over time through perhaps some kind of phagocytosis they become they became part of a larger cell and that cell ultimately may be the precursor to eukaryotic cells within the many different types of eukaryotic uh, organisms that we see today. And so this idea is supported by the evidence of the DNA sequences within these specific organelles being similar to bacterial strains and species that are currently alive today. So that is a rundown of the endosymbiotic uh, theory or the endosymbiotic hypothesis. And this is something that is quite important in the realm of biology, so keep that in mind, and I hope you found this at least mildly useful, and best of luck studying.